Hey, welcome to the Memorizing Pharmacology podcast. We're continuing with part of the Nursing Pharmacology Basics, which includes Kinetics and Dynamics, and this is Chapter 1. And this is going to be Part 3, where we have uh, six small cases uh, that we're going to go over. Again, I'm Tony Guerra. I'm a pharmacology professor at Moneary Community College. If you want to get a hold of me, uh, TonyThePharmacist at gmail.com. Uh, and you can always find uh, my books on Audible, uh, the audiobooks, but there's usually a print or ebook if you want those as well. Okay, case number one. You're working in a nursing home caring for an 86 year old stroke patient who complains of left knee pain secondary to arthritis. The patient has right sided weakness and difficulty swallowing with no gag reflex. You review the patient's MAR and note the provider has prescribed acetaminophen 325 either per oral or per rectal route. Which route would you choose and why? When we see that we have kind of this 50-50, we want to look into the case and see, well, what would make one significantly better than the other? And the difficulty swallowing with no gag reflex, if you were to circle something, that would be it. And what our word that isn't in here our real concern is aspiration and because we're worried about aspirating that's why we would prescribe the rectal route or prefer the rectal route number two mr johnson is a 92 year old male admitted to the med surge unit for severe pneumonia and the prescriber prescribed gentamicin antibiotic therapy when you review the order, you notice the initial dose is ordered at less than the standard recommended dose. What's the rationale behind the decreased starting gentamicin dose for the patient? What we really want to do is kind of look into the case and see what's not said, and that's where the critical thinking comes. You see the pneumonia, and yes, we have a gentamicin antibiotic therapy, but what would cause that decreased dose? You would expect some kind of disease state here. The only other information we really have is the patient's age. And so that's where the critical thinking comes in. If someone is older or if someone is very young, we want to think about organ function. And so when they're very young, their organ function is maturing. As you're very old, the organ function is deteriorating. When we think of gentamicin, which is aminoglycoside, we immediately think of kidney and ear, you know, ototoxicity and nephrotoxicity. So if kidney function is reduced, we look at our pharmacokinetic parameters. Again, absorption was really the small intestine. Distrib distribution would be the blood. Metabolism would be the liver. And excretion would be the kidney. So if we're concerned that the kidney is not going to excrete the gentamicin, we don't want to give too much because it's going to be staying in the body. And so the kidney and decreased kidney function is really what we're probably looking at to reduce that initial dose. Number three, Sarah is a nurse working on the med search for. She is reviewing her patient's chart and notes her patient has an 0600 vancomycin infusion. However, the trough level is not available. The nurse phones the lab and they state they will not be able to draw the trough level for an hour. What action should the nurse take? I think one of the toughest things in terms of actions to take is to do nothing yet. And I think that's really what you're looking at is we don't have enough information to safely give the medication. We want to really wait until that trough level is drawn so that we have the best information about whether this medication is in what would be known as the therapeutic window, not too low, not too high, kind of the three bears thing. And we want to avoid that toxicity and waiting an hour seems like wow, you know, we're not getting the medication on time. But again, you know, when we talk about the rights, it's got to be the right dose. And if in an hour we can get the right dose, well, that would be what we would want to do. Number four, Sam is a nurse working on the cardiology floor. He 
He has an order to administer a dose of atenolol, a beta blocker medication, to a patient at 0800. What actions should the nurse take prior to administering the medication? What is the anticipated therapeutic effect of this medication? So we really have two questions. What actions and then the therapeutic effect. So when we look at beta blockers, and we talked about this in the, the last episode, we're going to be talking about three different words, inotropic, chronotropic, and dromotropic. And we want to make sure that we understand those words. So it almost is better to kind of look at the therapeutic and adverse effects before we look at the actions someone should take. And so the therapeutic effect is we're expecting that there's going to be some reduction in uh, blood pressure or heart rate that we're expecting. And, and so we want to define those terms. The inotropic effect is the force of contraction of the heart reducing blood pressure. Chronotropic is heart rate, and I talked about bradycardia being 60 beats per minute, tachycardia being 100 beats per minute. And then dromotropic, we didn't talk about, which is we're talking about the conduction uh, through the heart. So all of those are going to be reduced. And those are things that we're going to expect. So what do we need to know? Well, we want to know that right now, what is the patient's current blood pressure? What is the patient's current pulse? And are they in a range that is something that we're going to be helping by reducing it. So if they're too low, if the patient is bradycardic and we reduce it even more, well, that would be causing an adverse effect and we don't want to do that. So knowing where the baseline is, those are the actions, what the anticipated therapeutic effect would be, reducing that blood pressure, reducing the heart rate in a way that's meaningful and helpful to the patient. Question number five. Julia is a 56-year-old patient admitted to the cardiology unit with new onset atrial fib. She has been prescribed amiodarone for her irregular heartbeat and is set to receive her first dose with her morning breakfast tray. When you arrive in the room, you notice that she has grapefruit juice on her breakfast meal tray. This is a concern. Why? What is the nurse's next action? So instead of two questions, we have three questions here. Is this a concern? And we're really saying, is there something we need to do? Is there something we need to worry about? And the answer is yes there. But why is kind of the critical thinking part? And then what are you going to do about it? When we talk about amiodarone and grapefruit juice, we're talking about enzymatic inhibition. And when we talk about something like that, we really want to talk about both sides. Okay. So enzymatic inhibition is when you slow down the enzymes that would normally metabolize amiodarone. And if you slow that down, we're going to increase the levels of the medication in the patient. The way to think about that, again, is, you know, you're at a restaurant, there's not, a, you've removed some of the wait staff. You know, times to get the food out are much higher, everything is going a bit slower, and those restaurateurs or the people that are eating are going to be there longer. And so the wait times, as people kind of come in and want to go to the restaurant, uh, they're going to be waiting quite a bit longer. And so you get kind of this real backlog. The same is true with the amiodarone. We don't want to have extra amiodarone around. We want the proper dose or the proper amount and proper blood levels, really. And in this way, we need to let the patient know, you know, you can't have grapefruit juice. And the patient says, okay, well, I'll just have my grapefruit juice in the morning and I'll take my amiodarone at night. And unfortunately, uh, it's not going to work that way where really it's going to have to be a different juice uh, that doesn't have this um, inhibitory effect. We should talk about the opposite effect, which is an inducer. So when you have a metabolic inducer, that's something that's and I'm not saying that grapefruit does, does this amiodarone. What I'm saying is that we want to understand both sides of it. You can slow things down, but you can also speed things up. 
and that we call enzymatic induction. And so an, an inducer would have made it so that there's not enough medicine and we would actually have to increase some kind of dose. Now that's not the case in this situation, but we want to understand both sides of the coin. And so when you have an inducer, you're going to have to actually raise the amount of medication that you're going to use. And you'll hear things about CYP, CYP, which is cytochrome P450. And so we might worry about CYP2D6 with fluoxetine. And that's kind of beyond the scope of what we're looking at here. But just to know that sometimes there's going to be things that reduce the ability of the body to break it down. Okay? And then there's going to be extra medication around. And then sometimes there are other things that are going to induce it and that's going to have less medication around. And you're going to be subtherapeutic rather than toxic. Let's look at our sixth one here. A nurse is caring for a 55 year old male who recently was admitted to the med surge unit for total knee replacement. He's prescribed hydrocodone, acetaminophen, 5 per 325 milligrams, Norco every six hours for moderate pain. The patient complains of pain in the knee, rating it at a 6. Review the clinical pharmacology section for this medication using the daily med link and answer the following questions. When does the nurse anticipate the medication will peak in action? When does the nurse anticipate another dose will be needed due to the half-life of this drug? In this case, we see that the, the peak is probably going to be an hour away, but it's unusual to see every six hours. Usually when you see hydrocodone with acetaminophen, you would see every four to six hours. So this patient might start complaining that, you know, right around four hours, four and a half hours, that their knee pain is, again, pretty severe and really hurts. And what we'd want to do is see if every six hours is going to be enough. The patient might say that, yeah, you know, I mean, uh, it does get a little bad, but every six hours isn't too bad. But uh, the patient might also say, well, you know, it, it's really hurting every four hours. And then we want to make sure we talk with the prescriber about it and tell them what's actually happening with the patient. All right, well, I hope going over these six uh, cases were helpful in kind of bringing home the chapter you know, on kinetics and dynamics. I plan to do this for all the chapters. So if you want to um, subscribe to the email list, uh, you just go to memorizingfarm, P-H-A-R-M.com. And there's a place where you can just put your name and email and uh, I'll send it out to you as a digest each week. So uh, just know that every Tuesday I send out the email in the morning. And uh, if you want to get it, you know, that's going to have either some mnemonic or some a review like this. Uh, eventually I'll probably just record the whole book because uh, it's just the readers for those that struggle with low vision that uh, it's just nice to be able to hear it but hear it conversationally rather than in that kind of robotic voice and also uh, it's the AI sometimes really struggles with some of these medication names and doesn't quite get them right. All right. Well, if you have questions for me, Tony the Pharmacist at gmail.com, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, otherwise, I will see you guys in the next episode.